Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So I continue to talk about uh, uh, and uh, uh, koans from uh, the book called Shoyodoku, and this is the original. And then I'm using uh, Thomas Clary's uh, translation, a uh, book of serenity, uh, for this purpose, uh, just to show you the uh, resources of it. So um, this is my fifth out of a uh, uh, ten time uh, talk series, and then uh, this is the last one for Shoyoroku. So uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I can only talk about very a <laughs> little bit of each uh, koan. So I chose today uh, case number eight and case number thirteen uh, because of the uh, based on. Some responses I received in the form of an email. Um, I'm quite surprised, pleasantly, that uh, many of uh, the people in this community shares the same professional background, uh, clinical uh, background. So uh, I continue to uh, try to uh, bring this core uh, down into our daily life, uh, particularly at the site of our clinical work. So anyway, case number eight, let's just go right into it. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting fun one. <laughs> um, it's called uh, Baizan's uh, Fox. I'm going to pronounce all these teachers' names in Japanese pronunciation. Uh, so it's Hyakujo's uh, uh, Wild Fox. So uh, the case says, I'm skipping introduction and verse, but uh, the case says, when uh, Hyakujo lectured in the hall, there was always an old man who listened to the teaching and then dispersed with the crowd. One day, he didn't leave. Hyakujo then asked him, who is it standing there? The old man said, in antiquity, in the time of the ancient Buddha Kashapa, I lived on this mountain. A student came and asked, does a greatly cultivated man, which means a greatly enlightened man, still fall into cause and effect or not? And I answered him, he does not fall into cause and effect. And then I fell into a wild fox body for 500 lives. Oh, uh, by the way, it's kind of probably strange if you don't have this cultural <laughs> connotation. Fox is a shapeshifter. So therefore, uh, this fox is appearing as an old man in front of a Hyakujo. So um, it's a, he's actually a fox and it's shapeshifting into old man and coming to uh, uh, listen to this lecture. So now I ask the teacher, I, I, I ask you, Hyakujo, to turn a word in my behave, for my behave. So Hyakujo said, he is not blind to cause and effect. The old man was greatly enlightened at these words. Kind of strange. <laughs> uh, but the, um, if you take a look at the original uh, language, uh, the portion which is really a focal point is these two words. Furaku inga and humai inga. Furaku inga is uh, translated as not falling into the law of causation. And humai inga is here translated as not blind to the law of causation. Um, so furaku inga is, um, in this case, uh, for this uh, old man. Oh, by the way, uh, I kind of talk, talked about this at the beginning, but uh, many of those koans are made up. It's a made up creative story. And there's always a uh, uh, kind of one-liner to show you, listen to this, this is a, uh, a kind of made-up story. Uh, for instance, um, you know, Fox, uh, yes, he's a <laughs> shapeshifter, but he's not probably going to uh, come to the talk by Hyakujo. And also this guy says, uh, in the ancient times of Buddha Kashapa, so which means it doesn't really even have a Buddhism, and then it doesn't even have a temple, and in the original, he says he was the Jushoku of this temple. So, uh, so this one liner says this is really a fake story. It's an allegorical story. So you really have to take a meaning out of it. Um, 
And then anyway, let me go back to Frak Inga. Frak Inga, uh, probably this man took it. If I study and practice very hard and I gain enlightenment, and with this great enlightenment stays, I am free from law of causation, which was wrong. And then uh, Humai Inga, this is a very interesting uh, you know, uh, expression. It took me a long time to uh, clearly actually see what this is trying to say. Who is not? And my is a description of, uh, you know, we wake up really early here. <laughs> and then when we wake up early, it's quite dark. And then uh, while I'm getting ready uh, recently, it's starting to get a little, uh, you know, uh, light is coming. So it's like uh, when the complete darkness, you can't really see anything. But when the sun rises or when the sun goes down, there's a little bit of a sense of uh, something is really starting to appear. But it, it almost it doesn't really matter, in another word. So uh, this is, uh, has a, some connotation of, well, I am aware of the law of causation, but at the same time, it actually doesn't matter. So um, what uh, this is saying is, um, <coughs> What exactly is free from the law of causation? Obviously, it is not about me being really enlightened and I'm not being affected by, so therefore I am free from uh, causation, uh, law of causation. It's really not that. Um, so I'm just going to go right into the conclusion uh, so that I can actually bring this down into uh, actual uh, life experience. But it is really about um, uh, we have ups and downs and ups and downs, ups and downs all the time. And this law of causation is basically what uh, uh, Okuma Roshi so skillfully uh, rephrases as a, uh, interdependent origination. And then uh, last Wednesday, Hoko-san was leading this group, uh, in a study group on Wednesday. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago. We are talking about this law of causation or interdependent origination. It's actually unfathomable. And you can really see that uh, if you just trace back into a family tree or trace back to the fact that why am I here now? Because I met this person and I met this person, this person met this person, etc. etc. Then you really clearly see this law of causation is unfathomable. And then so therefore, um, you know, we, nothing really happens in the way we expect. Really. And that's Dukkha, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, so, for instance, when I was really getting into this uh, type of koan, you know, uh, in a clinical situation, a uh, healthcare organization, particularly in New York State and New York City, maybe, but I doubt it's not only New York, it just goes into major acquisition repeatedly over and over and over and over and over. I've lived in New York for uh, nearly 40 years, and most of the organization changed its name or a uh, uh, company who owns the organization four times. So uh, it's really confusing. Uh, some time ago, I was going through this interview um, to become an American. And then uh, on my record, uh, it says such and such year, I was paid by, hired by such and such organization. And then uh, I completely forget those names because, you know, those names are like three names before. So the interviewer was asking me, uh, so who, 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 who do you work for? So I say the name, the current name, like, no, that's not what you said in the document. <laughs> that's not what it's written on the paper. And so each time that happens, what happens is, you know, um, some new company owns us. So therefore, uh, many of the supervisors are let go. And then we may actually be demoted to the lower ladder of the same team. And we may go a little higher suddenly. And then uh, all those people who are supervisors and vice presidents, etc., etc., suddenly find themselves in the market and they have to go through uh, interviews again to get a new job. And I'm sure this is a uh, you know, common uh, experience of all of you are having, not only for the people who work for the corporate, but also non-profit organizations, even Buddhist organizations. You know, changes happens. 
But at that time, I was really thinking, does it actually matter to me? You know, um, my aspiration to aspiration, I'm really working on the principle of this uh, work is um, my life work. So if I have to work out with this really posh corporate to look like, you know, office, or if I have to be in the field and I have to, if I have to be assigned for this uh, poverty struck, um, you know, uh, immigrants neighborhood, does it make any difference? Yes, on the surface I may be lifted up, but sometimes uh, some people may I put down. But for me, it's not up or down, or, uh, bad or good, or fortunate or unfortunate. Uh, principle is a principle. What I'm doing is just uh, being somebody right in front of me, uh, and then hope to learn from this person, patient. I really hate that word. <laughs> But, um, and then I try to bring some sort of solace and comfort, hopefully, do that. So that principle doesn't really matter uh, if I am up or down. So that's what this is talking about. So if you really stay away from my sense of failure, success, misfortune, unfortunate, etc., etc., therefore, it doesn't matter if I went up or go down, so it's the best way to uh, free yourself from the uh, law of causation. Because if the law of causation is regarded as, wow, I'm fortunate, uh, I'm uh, unfortunate, etc., etc., then you will be falling <coughs> into it. But uh, in the truest sense, uh, free from uh, the law of causation, is really go beyond this uh, discrimination between a good and a bad. Uh, in the room I was assigned in the dormitory uh, this time, this time uh, there's a wonderful writing uh, that says um, uh, Jinjupo Sekai Kore Ikka no Myoju The entire ten direction world is one bright jewel. And so every morning I wake up and then right in front of me there's this saying written. Um, in uh, this bright jewel uh, is also a very famous uh, title of the famous fascicle in Shobo Genzo. And in it, uh, Dongen actually quotes this Hulak Inga and Humai Inga. Uh, so I'm just going to read it uh, with uh, Okumura Roshi's translation. How can we fail to love the jewel? The colors and the luster are infinite. Each and every aspect of the color and luster are the virtue of the entire ten direction world. Who can take them away? No one would throw a tile away at the marketplace. Do not worry about the falling or not falling. And this is uh, Huraku Inga, Humai Inga. Uh, not falling into cause and effect within the six realm of samsara, not being blind to cause and effect is the original righteousness from head to tail. The bright jewel is the fact that bright jewel is the eye. So in this case, um, uh, not blind to cause and effect meaning, I am aware how this works, and then it doesn't matter. So, because I'm really beyond uh, regarding this from my own perspective, this is bad and this is good. And all I have to do is just to do what I need to do at this time. Um, this immediately reminds me a couple of our episodes I went through. Uh, there's an organization called the Co uh, Story Corps. Uh, I wonder if some of you are familiar with that. It's a non-profit organization who records um, American people's oral history. But we are not talking about the interviews with the very famous people, or celebrities, and etc. Et just the ordinary people like us. And then um, uh, many of those uh, interviews are maintained and kept in National Archive in Washington, D.C. And they also have a, uh, uh, I think it's a 10 minutes or 15 segments uh, every week in the morning edition, I think that's the title of the morning show on NPR. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, one of the, uh, I think she was an intern, 
Perry, uh, Perry was a wonderful uh, Buddhist practitioner, uh, came to hospice and became a volunteer. And then uh, after that, uh, she took a job for Storico and became a segment producer. And then because of the experience she had with us in hospice, she was really interested in opening up this new segment of recording, uh, the last conversation of the hospice patients with his uh, or her uh, you know, loved one. So very often we facilitate the conversation and then uh, the patients and patients' caregiver have a conversation. And it was a really moving uh, experience. And then, uh, so what we did was we actually offered our site as a test case and then uh, we brought this into, uh, you know, uh, inter-agents. Agents. So uh, we were the first one, but we brought it into other hospitals, other hospice organizations, and we recorded uh, practically over 100 uh, recordings. And I did a uh, couple of dozens of uh, facilitations and interviews, and one of them was a very interesting case, um, exactly about this. Uh, there was a couple of uh, homeless people, um, but uh, uh, woman came to a hospice residence and then she, uh, first thing we usually do is uh, we really like to you know uh, find out if there's anything they like to do before they die and then she said uh, there's this one man she's been thinking about but she's been separated from this man for a little while and she doesn't know where this man is and then story was uh, but anyway, we just went into this major surge and within just about two days or so, we discovered uh, this man and had him come over and then there was a reunion. It was very moving. And then we found out the story. Uh, this man was just like us. Uh, any of us in this society can become homeless, you know, with a series of misfortune, uh, un uh, in unfortunate things happen. And in his case, um, well, he loses the job because of this merger and acquisition happens and his corporate was bought out and so therefore there was massive layoffs. And then he couldn't find the new jobs for a little while, so therefore they couldn't pay the rent. So therefore, mother and the child decided to move into, uh, sorry, wife and uh, their child move into uh, wife's mother's place, but mother's place is crammed and then, uh, you know, wife's mother is also quite uh, unhappy about what's going on with the husband. So the husband doesn't have a place to go. Uh, his name is Larry. Actually, I uh, contacted the story call last week, and they discovered the interview I did, and they told me, uh, if you like to use the name, you have a consent, uh, use the name. So I said, uh, that's great. His name is Larry, and the woman's name is Kathy. It's a story about Larry and Kathy. So Larry, uh, ended up staying over at his friends, sometimes here, sometimes go here, and everyone starts to come to the point, you have to leave. So he ends up going to storage place, and he slept in the storage place a little while, but the supervisor of the storage place said, no, you can't do this, that's not in the contract. So he ended up being on the street. And a few days after, uh, he started to see how this you know, homeless community starts to collaborate. And then uh, one night he was walking to the place, he felt he was safe to sleep over. Then he found a bunch of guys and trying to rape uh, this woman, a uh, homeless woman. So he just cuts in and there's a little bit of fight going on. But somehow she, he, he rescued her. This is Kathy. And then uh, they discovered, you know, sleeping on the street is always really risky. And at that time we had, uh, well, in New York City we have something called a Staten Island Ferry, if you're familiar with that. And Staten Island Ferry has two stations, and both in Staten Island and Manhattan. And um, actually it's a safe place for homeless people to sleep. And also during the day, uh, outside of the rush hours, Within the ferry boat, there are quite a large community actually living there. So they ended up living there. And then Larry discovered uh, Kathy doesn't seem to be quite right uh, in her mind and also physicality as well. And looks like she's quite sick. 
So therefore, he tries to go to the um, bring her to emergency room, but for some reason or another, hospice, uh, hospitals kind of refuses her. I don't think it's possible, but somehow that happened. And then uh, under Mayor Bloomberg's uh, you know, incentive, uh, there was a, a troop of social worker came with a policeman to the Staten Island ferry, uh, tried to place these people in a safe place, but those group of the homeless people thought that was a raiding. So therefore they started to just run away. Like. And then on the process of running away, they got separated. And in the end, each one of them are placed into separate single room occupancy. Then she, Kathy, got sick. And then uh, they were looking and looking and looking at e for, for each other, but they couldn't really find it. But in a, such a strange interdependent origination, Kathy came to us. Uh, we are the only um, hospice residency for those people who do don't have a home uh, to be taken care of by safely towards the end of their life. Can you imagine we have uh, 8.5 million people and we only at that time had uh, 16 rooms. So there was a long waiting list. So it's just a kind of amazing chain of you know, events. She ended up coming here. And so therefore we have a full, a fully equipped to look for people and they have an encounter. So I thought, wow, this is such an amazing story, particularly on the co uh, side of Larry's story. This is really like a Huraku Inga, Huma Inga story. So I wanted to really record this and then I set up the date, but that uh, date was three days uh, away. And within those three days, Kathy's um, condition got worsened very quickly and she died. Uh, we had a really difficult time to find a place or find the budget to either cremate or a place to bur bur bury. Uh, unfortunately, this became uh, one of the only three cases I had to give up and the patient's body went to Potter's Field. So for that purpose, for that reason also, I really felt this story should be recorded. So um, I did a recording with Larry and I became the interviewer and this whole story was really unwrapped. I was just quite impressed at Larry's posture of uh, whatever happens, he's always thinking for the others, thinking for the wife, thinking for the wife's home, thinking for friends' situation, and then thinking for Kathy, etc., etc. You know, we are under Bodhisattva vow, but we do actually meet much better Bodhisattvas in the world. It was really inspiring. <coughs> so. Another story. You know, in the daily um, life of our lives, we have lots of complaints. <laughs> you know, there's this nagging voice all the time, I wish it wasn't this way, I wish it was, would be this way, etc. Et um, but um, uh, we try, you know, each moment, no, no, this is the right thing we should do in this occasion, in that occasion, just get this, you know, nagging voice out. But um, uh, when you hear some people who are in an extreme situation, it really becomes a bit like a curse <laughs> to us, right? Um, 3.11 is, uh, for us Japanese, is like a 9.11, the resonation to the American. As a matter of fact, I'm both, so 9-11, <laughs> I was really sucked into 9-11 and really changed my entire life. But 3-11 uh, also changed my life entirely. 3-11 uh, uh, is the day uh, we had one of the uh, hugest uh, recorded hu in human history, the uh, biggest earthquake uh, in northern part of Japan. Uh, this is 10 years ago already. Um, uh, uh, on that day, uh, we are, I think, 13 hours behind. I was in New York and I was on call. And then uh, chaplain's on call is really difficult because we have to be on call seven days straight and we are expected to be in the field at nine o'clock in the morning. And then, um, so on that particular day, I kept on receiving calls throughout the night uh, luckily, I didn't have to go out to the streets, but um, 
Uh, I was able to maneuver all of those calls over the phone, but I remember very clearly around uh, 3 o'clock at night, uh, this was the third call, so I'm really like not being able to sleep and not being able to be awake, very tired, but somehow I maneuvered this uh, request over the phone, and then I was uh, going to uh, type it in, because you really have to write the medical record before the next day comes, right? And so uh, you have to take a, a, a medical laptop and you, you have to start writing. And then I completed it and it was nearly 4 a.m. And then uh, I thought, well, I might as well check the email. And when I opened the email, there was a news. And then this news was live from Japan. And it was this immense <laughs> tsunami is coming and destroying, and just going into kilometers and kilometers into, into the internet. Uh, inland and also the volume of the, uh, the tsunami was uh, in some places it was over 20 to 30 meters high which is basically you know original Godzilla is supposed to be 25 meters tall <laughs> so you can imagine how incredible it was and also I don't know how you are familiar with that tsunami but 30 centimeters one foot tsunami uh, destroys everything so you can imagine what was going on my biggest concern was, of course, I had my uh, own uh, hospice project in my hometown, which is one block away from the ocean. So I'm trying to desperately call Japan, I called my sister, who is supposed to be handling my, uh, our uh, facility. But uh, first, several calls goes on, but it just keeps on ringing. It doesn't really, you know, uh, get through. And then shortly after, the whole line just went down and I couldn't locate where my sister was for three next, three next three days. During that time, many things was happening in Japan. And this tsunami and earthquake was probably the most recorded uh, tsunami and uh, earthquake because this is current time and everyone has a smartphone. So everyone is really filming this, right? One of the films which was discovered later on uh, sees, shows Tsunami comes to this immense bay and then just go back up on this large river. And then tsunami's force is actually even stronger when it pulls back, it's doubly strong. So this uh, film is this uh, large river pulling back into the ocean into immense wave. And on the top of the wave, there was a tiny little you know, image of a car. And on top of this car, there was a man standing on the roof and trying to jump out because uh, there's a river and there's a bay, there's a several uh, bridges. So this is the last bridge go into the bay and he's trying to just dive out of this uh, car and trying to grab the edge of the uh, you know, bridge. And this bridge is also invaded by this water. Like, and there's just tiny little portion is still dry, and in that somehow he's trying to dive into. And there's a tiny little image. There's one guy who's also trying to survive and probably thinking, oh, well, I'm going to die because this, you know, water is also coming to the bridge too. But he's trying to pull him back up. Seven months later, uh, national broadcasting system actually was able to locate these two guys. Incredibly, those two guys actually survived. And then in the interview, what I was really impressive about was, why did you do such a thing? And then uh, this man who was trying to climb out from the uh, car was, he was absolutely sure he's going to die. Of course, you know, of course. But he thought, um, uh, this is also quite true, uh, medically and also psychologically. Uh, he must have heard about this before, uh, but he thought, if I'm sucked into the ocean, no one could discover my body. And if a uh, uh, you know, survived one, loved one, cannot really see the dead body, your breathement process is really complex. So therefore, he thought, well, I'm going to take my last chance so that my body can be discovered. If I just hang on to the you know, rails of the bridge and I just scream, crawl into it, then I may die, but somehow my corpse will be, after water goes in, uh, <coughs> will be discovered. So therefore, uh, the bereavement process will be a little more easier. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So, in another word, in the last moment, think, uh, instead of thinking, oh, this is awful, this is bad, he's actually thinking for the others. So it really felt like, wow, this is quite amazing. Um, um, I wish I could be like that. <laughs> so this is really like the story of um, you know, two bodhisattva uh, practice. And again, I really have to say, I've been very lucky, um, blessed by this um, uh, interdependent wage nation. I always uh, have type of the, you know, a realm of work I can learn from all these uh, real life episodes of the people who really went through this. So this, I, again, I forgot my clock. Am I doing okay? You're fine. Okay. 15 minutes or so. Okay. So Whatever let me want. go into uh, case 13. Uh, this is Rinzai Katsuro. Uh, translation by uh, Thomas Clary says, Rinzai's, uh, I'm just uh, pronounce his name as Japanese, Rinzai's, Rinzai's blind ass. Uh, I'm just going to uh, read only the case. Uh, Case says, when Rinzai was just about to die, I'm sorry, I'm a hospice person, so I constantly talk about death, but I think it's important because we tend to be always sucked into live, live, live portion. We tend to forget it's a package deal. So um, please excuse me. When Rinzai was just about to die, <coughs> he admonished uh, Sansei, after I pass on, uh, this is not, um, I, I would say, after I die, don't destroy my treasure of the eye of uh, the tooth, uh, which is a translation of a Shobo Genzo. So he says, after I die, don't destroy my Shobo Genzo. Sansei said, how dare I destroy my teacher's Shobo Genzo. And then Rinzai, he's a very testy guy, of course, as you know. So Rinzai immediately tests uh, Sansei. You say so, but if someone suddenly questions you about it, how will you reply? Translation says, uh, Sansei immediately shouted, but this is a, a mild translation. I'm going to cover my microphone so that you don't really get uh, surprised. But what it is says originally is, Sansei, CUT! <laughs> uh, so Rinzai says, oh, who would have known that my Shobo Genzo would, be, would perish in this blind ass? Uh, this is a typical Chinese expression. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, in words you put down, but in your real intention, you are really praising. Uh, in Japanese culture, we have a completely opposite style. And for instance, every time I come to uh, San Shinji, I like to bring some little gift for Yuko-san and Okumu Roshi. So uh, I go into, um, you know, this uh, uh, Japanese supermarket in New Jersey and I look and look and look and something uh, they might like. And then when I bring it, I always say in Japanese expression, this is such a little trifle thing, but uh, I feel so embarrassed to give such a thing to you. But if you don't mind, please keep it. But uh, that's an expression. In my mind, say, I went into hours and hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet the best portion of this category of the food is uh, So in the same manner, and Chinese culture actually has a very different one. So in another word, uh, this is actually, Rinzai say, wow, good. So you will maintain my teaching. So the problem here is this cut portion. Uh, you know, I originally come from uh, the inside tradition and then I have seen something kind of very odd uh, because of this cut. Uh, there's an expression in Zen world, uh, Rinzai's shouting, Rinzai's cuts, and then uh, Toksan's 30 blows. Uh, so uh, Toksan also has this very kind of volatile style of uh, teaching and there's this stick and uh, someone uh, when the moment comes, he you know, uh, hits 30 times. So it's like an expression of this type of uh, teaching. Um, once I was in this monastery and taking uh, some portion of a residential program, and this was uh, late 80s and early 90s. It was deep into really messy AIDS epidemic. 
And in this monastery, there was a, a man of uh, late 30s and the early 40s who were in a maximum uh, security prison uh, because he was charged for secondary murder. And what it was, was he was trying to save somebody and then ended up killing someone. But he was in this uh, maximum uh, pre uh, security prison. And then uh, this monastery had a long-standing um, prison reach out program and he was a core member of this group and then also they discovered uh, this man was HIV positive and starting to be symptomatic and of course you know on the prison side they don't have budget for taking care of those people who are sick so uh, they would rather release them uh, under some sort of supervision Recent years, uh, they come to us, hospice organization, directly. But in this case, they released him under the supervision of this monastery. And um, uh, I was uh, his uh, roommate, and I didn't know his background until someone uh, whispered to me, Isan, aren't you afraid? People are telling, uh, uh, talking to each other, you are a cellmate instead of a roommate. <laughs> Like, what does that mean? But anyway, um, he was actually the kindest man I have ever met, interestingly. And then one day, you know, he's starting to show the symptoms, so it's very difficult to sit. And also, uh, in this Rinzai tradition temple, you will be shouted at if you move. And then there are two monitor, uh, monitors. And both monitors are also, you know, 19, late 80s and 1990s, the uh, whole Zen community was very young. So the monitors were also 30 something years old and kind of cocky guy. And then uh, this man starts to just, you know, whistle. And then he starts, <sighs> and then this monitor says, be still. And then he starts to say, sit still. And then he just can't stop, you know, he's sick. And then suddenly, this monitor got really upset and he carries his kyosaku and he comes to him like BAM! BAM! Like this is Toksan Sati blows. <laughs> and then uh, um, this uh, place was quite a uh, busy place, so we sat to two lines uh, on both uh, wall. And of course, I was uh, sitting right behind him. So therefore, while he keeps uh, hitting him, uh, kyosaku actually broke. It probably, you know, uh, come to think about retrospectively, it's very dangerous because if you hit with that force here, it's quite close to artery. And also, you know, this man is, you know, almost coming into the final stage of AIDS. But I don't know what happened. But anyway, I fell and flew to my head. <laughs> And then, of course, uh, this monitor apologized us later on, but I always had this problem with about the hitting and also cuts thing. So, what does it exactly does it mean and what, it, what does it do? Uh, obviously, both hitting and shouting is a way to bring somebody back into right here, right now, obviously. And it has nothing to do with any kind of magical word or magical thing. But it is really true, isn't it? You know, in those uh, cases, when you are into your stories and you're trying just so still, but in your mind it's just running and running and running, and someone moves and the monitor says, sit still, and you feel, oops, and you come back. And that is true. But it doesn't have to be that way. And particularly, you know, in a clinical situation, uh, you really start to see the truth, truthfulness, truthfulness of Gautama Buddha's teaching. Uh, suffering really gets accumulated when you just slip into your thoughts. So therefore, in many cases, not only us, but probably therapists and doctors and nurses have to have some sort of way of doing cuts into something much milder way. So this was a really like long-standing my way of exploration. Um, uh, there are so many things I can tell you about, but uh, uh, let me just bring a couple of the things. Uh, we once had in our hospice residence, there was a 28-year-old boy. Uh, I'm sorry, I call him boy because he was sick. He became sick when he was uh, 12 years old. 
and he has been he had been bedridden uh, because of this uh, he inherited this uh, uh, disorder uh, progressive muscle degeneration and by the time he came to us of course he's completely bedridden and mainly bedridden for bedridden for over 10 years so he has a lot of frustration and of course you can totally imagine how frustrated this young man was you know um, in his entire life he, uh, he probably felt so uh, you know dismissed by all of the people around who is just outside and active and going to school and playing and sports etc etc in the meanwhile he has to stay in bed and he has to tolerate this pain right so he was a screamer such a strong screamer so he, when he gets frustrated, he goes, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this, but... And so much so, entire floor of our hospice residents are like, ooh, what's going on? And we get to use to it, you know, but uh, patients come and go, come and go, right? So each time some new patient comes in, what the hell is going on? And at one point, we had to send him to inpatient unit because uh, uh, pain uh, <coughs> management was inaccurate for the time being. And then uh, we brought him to this uh, inpatient unit where I also am assigned to go from time to time. And so I know these nurses and doctors very well. So when I went to visit, uh, I, can, I guess I can use his name because I have signed paper, Mamok, um, so people said, oh my goodness, it's a who? do you think <laughs> you brought to us? He's a screamer, isn't he? So there, he was causing this whole trouble too. And then a uh, medical director was a woman uh, who was very, very Buddhist friendly. And she actually utilized me as a human guinea pig, uh, pig and you put all of those you know, wires in me. And then he, she said, meditate. <laughs> and then uh, this, you know those uh, experiments, right? And she was really trying to prove meditation really helps to take care of the patients in anxiety, etc., etc., so she can get the grant to open the uh, meditation group in, um, uh, in, inside the hospital. But anyway, she comes in, she said, can't you do something about this? Well, you know, uh, of course, Zazen, <laughs> our Shikanta Zazen, has no purpose. But why not, you know? Uh, if you are uh, in the position to bring some sort of comfort and solace, you can Im uh, you know, uh, improvise many things. So once he came back to our residence, uh, I went in and we really explored many things. And what I, I really thought about was, so Mamu, I understand the whole body really hurts. And he says, yes, but not always so. So I started to think, oh, this is becoming a Buddhist conversation. <laughs> and then he, I said, I understand a uh, whole body doesn't uh, hurt very often, but is there any one portion that is not affected by your pain? This is a Buddhist conversation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he takes it in the same, uh, you know, realistic way. And he looks and thinks. These people are really desperate, so they really get it right away. Uh, he says, my right hand, is he sleeping? so his right hand, the palm, doesn't hurt. I go, oh, this is great. So can I just touch your hand and can I tickle you? So he, I said, yeah, okay. And then I said, to tickle, and he said, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> and then a little while, he's relaxed. And then he starts to come, uh, another thought comes in his mind. You can immediately tell because his demeanor changes and he starts to come like. <laughs> okay. And then uh, I, you know, this is a screaming moment. The screaming moment is a true moment, right? So uh, what I can do is just witness. But also let him know, you know, do you remember I'm still here? I'm still tickling you? And then he somehow comes back and he looks at me like with a surprise look, oh, you're still here. <laughs> and then, oh. <laughs> and then little moment, he has this comfortable moment, and he goes scream, and then, and repeating several times, he somehow falls, falls asleep. I kept on doing this uh, for week after week after week, every time I was in my office. Um, but he died in, at the age of 28. But in my mind, this tickle is cuts. 
Um, so in my invention, that was my cuts. So you don't have to do these cuts or blows. You can really take um, this uh, teaching in. Yes, right here, right now is the only place and only uh, time that exists. And this is the Hikyoki. This is the ultimate place to return. So, uh, and we do understand that when your mind takes you away from this ultimate place, suffering starts to really multiply. So therefore, is there any way to do this cuts differently? Uh, I'd like to talk about one more episode. Is that okay, time oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, When I was a volunteer, uh, before I became a professional hospice person, I had 15 years as a volunteer. But at that time, I thought, uh, I felt all the regulations are becoming tighter and tighter and tighter. When I started out in 1980s, there's none of those regulations. So we can really be involved with a real, you know, hands-on care. Uh, but uh, uh, all of this, I sue you, you sue me kind of culture, started to bring all these uh, strange regulations. Like volunteers no longer able to feed the patient, no longer even uh, hold the cup for the patient, no longer can touch the patient, so therefore, what are we doing, <laughs> right? So I decided to take a, a test and I became a licensed uh, patient care assistant. So therefore, I can officially touch and officially feed the people. And then, um, in, uh, you know, in one of my area of the interest is geriatric care. I explained why, because my parents died really young age of mine. So I always wondered how it would be to live in an uh, you know, older generation. So therefore, uh, when I go to volunteer, I really loved this uh, geriatric hospice union. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, on the process of dying, there's a moment uh, feeding is not necessary. But it's a very precocious, uh, a precarious moment because before that you really have to keep eating so that the process of skin break doesn't accelerate. But in the dementia patient, it's very difficult. Um, I was really interested in dementia and uh, because uh, it is really the question about what exactly the reality is. Uh, in Buddhist, you know, uh, textbook, we always try to understand the reality of mind is not the reality of you, so what is the true reality, etc., etc., you know, very theologically. But in the actual clinical portion, uh, it's a real, like, real-life <laughs> issue. And so um, I spent uh, nearly a year in psychiatry ward, and not as a patient, but uh, as an intern. <laughs> and then uh, I learned so much about, so how each one of us view reality. Once there was a woman in this unit, and then uh, by this time uh, I had built up this reputation, I'm actually being able to make these dementia patients actually eat, while uh, nurses and uh, nursing assistants have a hard time. So, um, head of this medical team, again this was a woman uh, doctor from Canada with a high heel on, a uh, French accent, I was always really impressed she can really, you know, maneuver this job with a high heel. But anyway, she said, Isan, uh, with a French accent, Isan, uh, I have heard about your reputation. There's this patient uh, who's really refusing to eat. Can you demonstrate in front of us how you feed this patient? So they brought this patient into the nursing, st near nursing station, and she's in the reclining chair. And then, you know, uh, my... Uh, biggest rule is when I don't know what to do, find a chair. So this way you sit and you can observe. And then somehow, just like uh, sitting in Zazen, something kind of arises and something starts to kind of dissolve. So that's my rule. So I observed her a little bit and then to make it short, I recognize she is, in her reality, she's thinking, she's a Jamaican. So she's in the harbor in Jamaica and then trying to come home in New York. Uh, this is a typical, like, common thread of the themes, trying to come home before you die. And then uh, she's in the waiting room 
And as a matter of fact, uh, the whole setup of the hospital does look like a waiting room anyway. So she's really anxious uh, because she, uh, the, a boat is uh, you know, departing soon. So therefore, she doesn't want to miss the boat. But in the meanwhile, she's kind of coming into this side of the reality because she's seated in front of the nursing station. In front of her, there's a long corridor. So therefore, it does also look like uh, uh, well, inside the boat. So when I got that, I felt, oh, without uh, rejecting her reality and then without rejecting my reality, we can find some sort of meeting point. So if she slips into this, oh, is it already inside the boat? Uh, I said, yes, it does look like inside the boat, doesn't it? So that means you are already in the boat, you didn't miss the boat. So this is a breakfast time. She said, oh, and then she started to eat. So they were like, oh. But for me, that was my curse. Um, you know, I discovered the moment she's slightly leaned toward my reality. And then I said, cuts. But in my way, I said, so you are already in the boat. This is breakfast time. She said, oh, she came back to me right here, right now, and right here, right now, her job is to eat, my job is to feed. So this cut is actually quite juicy. I started out hating this, <laughs> then because of that, I really fermented it and processed it for years and years and years. And at work site, we really kind of found out what it means. So uh, again, uh, over and over and over and over, koans are really juicy. It's like uh, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, umeboshi, <laughs> umeboshi plan, uh, uh, you know, uh, exercise. But um, it's like osobuko. You chew and chew and chew and chew, and there are more taste to come, and then uh, taste changes, and then you learn so much out of this. Um, this is also a power of, I think, Chinese. Um, you know, language system, because this Chinese language system is so succinct and short, and each character has such layers and hues of the meaning, and you can really chew it and chew it and chew it, and keep trying, does this mean this? Does this mean that in your clinical work or any kind of work you do? So, um, well, <laughs> I really want to speak more and more about show your local book for Serenity, but um, we are really looking forward to Hojo-san's uh, Genzoe coming this week. And after Genzoe week, uh, following three weeks, I like to pull out wonderful koans uh, that Dogen selected for his uh, Eihei Shingi. Uh, very often people think Eihei Shingi is like a whole bunch of rules and regulations. It is actually not. It's a wonderful, uh, uh, very well edited collection of the sto uh, you know, Zen stories and all of them, all of them is about our work, about our life. So um, I really take lots of inspiration from the uh, Dogen selection of koans in Ehe Shingi. So I like to keep on talking about that for three consecutive weeks after Genzo. Uh, so I spoke too much. No. Okay. No. So, um, I... Do you want questions? Yes. yes. Comments? Yes. Okay. Please share your experience. Does anybody have a question or comment for Isan? If you're in the gallery, just uh, unmute yourself and jump right in. Punished 
the expressing one side of reality and that falling into sort of this shape shifting state is really just non atman is just that is that is life right we are, are constantly changing shape changing form um with, with, with that, does, does that make any sense in any way in the tradition? Oh, yes. Maybe look at it that um, way? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, you know, um, I see what you're talking about, but uh, my way of looking at this kind of uh, double uh, layered, uh, I think one way, this is a story that takes place uh Hyakujo's mind. It is not a chronological story. Uh, Hyakujo's, inside Hyakujo is having this internal conversation, what exactly is Huraku Inga or Huma Inga? And that's one thing I get from this scene. And another thing is, um, you know, I, uh, in my last years uh, of my professional, uh, clinical profession, uh, I often spend time uh, by asked by uh, other organizations, sometimes it's a religious organization or sometimes it's a university, but very often a medical organization to talk about what we do. And then, you know, each time I go, there's always uh, this old man, fox kind of people. <laughs> uh, because when you are uh, seated in the uh, you know, chair and standing on the podium, uh, and then there's always people who are sitting very far away. It's a bit like my dog really hated when I showered him. So therefore, when I'm taking a bath or when I'm in the shower, he always comes in like... I hope he's not planning to give me a shower. And he's just uh, coming from... Uh, the, this is the wall. And then I thought, wow, these people are like my Ray who's afraid of taking a shower. And then I immediately understood, so they are interested in the subject, but uh, they are really kind of uh, awkward and afraid to go directly into the subject. So when I read uh, this uh, case, I really see this uh, kind of awkwardness of, um, you know, old man who is a fox, uh, who is actually very uh, similar to my dog Ray. Uh, peaking and peaking, not really getting into the core of the idea uh, because of some sort of fear going on. And it is actually fearful for us in many cases to handle what it is right now because very often what it is here right now is not what we wanted. <laughs> so therefore, um, you know, my image really overlaps with uh, those two things uh, when I read uh, these cases. Uh, I really don't know the uh, original intention why they brought this shape, shifter, uh, fox, and old man, etc., etc., but that's how I kind of get it. Thank you. Thank you. Give you kind of a general question, I guess. Uh, I uh, also did koan work with uh, Yo Yu, and I remember her giving a lecture once about something that uh, Mezumi Roshi mm -hmm. talked about. A koan is a touchstone of your life, mm -hmm. and I mean I've always kind of thought about it like that, but I sort of have a difficulty with the idea of it being a touchstone. Touchstone. Um, oh, a touchstone, like when you're crossing somewhere, you have a stone to... That's well, a it's, stone. It's, it's a way of saying that there's this one thing that is, mm -hmm. in my mind, you know, a stone is hard, it's solid, it's mm -hmm. always the same. Mm -hmm. That's my problem with it. Mm -hmm. So. It's what you touch in your life mm. to uh -huh. 
Well, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Particularly those two I right. just wanted to talk about. It's really like that. Yeah. Yes. And um, I have also uh, explained by a Japanese teacher from Rinzai tradition. It is a bit like a putting stone in the steel pond. In another word, uh, you actually taking the stone into you and sitting with the stone in the stillness of Zazen. Um, you know, I resisted very often uh, that kind of expression, etc., etc. Then I thought I was doing just totally different approach, but in another word, it may be the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I read something, it really strikes me all that time, and then it just doesn't leave me. Sometimes I sleep and I have a dream of those one line that strike me. And I keep it for over and over. It doesn't have to be koan. It just can be just one line from any kind of Buddhist text. Uh, and then in work, in actual, you know, uh, interaction of the people, particularly with the fellow clinicians and patients and patients, mm -hmm. family members, and I have this little moment of, oh, that's what it meant. <laughs> So uh, then you learn from it and how you actually next time, if something similar happens, maybe I can find out to function a little better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It strikes me that if touchstone is something that we can rely on and come back to, mm -hmm. then koans are pointing us back to mm -hmm. what is this one unified reality. Mm. What is sort of the one true thing? Mm. <laughs> right? So in that way, although they seem to be abstract or they seem to be opaque, mm. uh, if we understand them in the way that you're talking about them, in the way that you're practicing with them, then they're always pointing us back to the touchstone. They're always pointing mm. us back to what we rely on. Mm. What is this one true reality? Mm. You know, it, it's, it's a mindfulness exercise in that way and that it's reminding us to practice. It's reminding us, you know, what we were taught. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it, that's why it's interesting. So when you were saying touch on, hmm, <clears throat> where was she going with that? And it might not be where Myoyu was going with that, but if I think about, like, what is the central thing, mm -hmm. in that way it's interesting, because mm -hmm. they are all pointing us back to mm -hmm. that in their various mm -hmm. ways. So in another word, um, cuts is mm -hmm. uh, Titonat Han's mindfulness bell. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And actually, when he was saying touch I'm like, oh, that's the cuts. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the here and now. Right. So that's mm. an interesting way to think about that. Mm. Yeah. I wouldn't mm. have gone there until I, yeah. you know, kind of heard you uh, with your experiences with those things. But yeah, I also thought, oh, touch oh, that's the cuts. Mm. <laughs> and Hoko san and I had this previous conversation, just two of us, and Hoko san asked me, so when you were much younger, what was your favorite case? And then I mentioned about uh, you know the case. I'm going to talk about it next uh, time. I again, but um, but uh, this case is one of those. And most of the time, you focus on the first several lines, but then my um, focus started to shift when my ch life changes. And then when I was in one particular portion of my life, the last line started to get illuminated. Illuminated then it really became such a strong cause of my action next time. Uh, I'll talk about it next time. So it's really true, isn't it? It's so juicy. <laughs> you can chew and chew and chew. But again, I really feel this is the attraction of Dogen's writing. Because Dogen's writing is like all over the places. It's like chewable and tasteable. <laughs> And it, it takes a long time to digest, and he's just so amazing. So um, we are all looking forward to Genzoe. Yes. Spend five days chewing, chewing, tasting, tasting. Maybe that's why Uchiyamanoshi called it as a midokukai, tasting, leading uh, group. <laughs>